Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 52 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about hypnosis. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, remember to like the podcast when you see it on Facebook or retweet it when you see it on Twitter. And be sure to leave comments if you can. We really appreciate getting those comments. And all of these things help goose the various social media algorithms to make sure that everybody gets to see the the posts that we put up and we can other people can enjoy. Also, if you have not yet subscribed, if you're listening to this, you know, someone's passed it along to you or you're listening to it on the website. Be sure to subscribe to the show so you get every episode. You don't miss anything in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, all those places. And if you subscribe on our YouTube channel, either SQPN's YouTube channel or Jimmy's YouTube channel, we post it in both places. Be sure to subscribe, but also hit the bell to get notifications of new episodes so you don't you don't miss one. And like I said, uh, please share the podcast with people and spread the love <laughs> so that we can enjoy this. I'm sure there, there, we, we always hear from people saying, Oh, I'm so glad that uh, a friend passed this along or recommended it. Uh, I'm enjoying your episode. So please do that for us. So we really do appreciate, appreciate that. So uh, our topic today, hypnosis, since the 1700s, people have been fascinated by hypnosis. People were mesmerized by tales of Franz Mesmer, hypnotizing women and getting them to do his bidding. And today it's claimed that hypnosis can help you stop smoking, lose weight, control anxiety, and a, a whole host of other things. And it's also claimed that it can be used to bring back repressed memories of childhood, abuse, uh, past lives, and alien abductions. But how many of these claims are true and how many are false? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. But before we get to that first, I, I, I do want to point out today is this, this episode marks sort of our one-year anniversary episode of Mysterious World. Yeah, this is uh, episode 52, and um, not counting bonus episodes that we've also released in the course of the last year, it's also airing the last weekend in July, and our first episode debuted in the second week of August in 2018, so we're basically at the one-year mark now. Wow. So, happy anniversary, everybody. <laughs> uh, it's hard to believe. We've, we've already, it's just, it feels like we just started doing this, but uh, it's so much fun. Uh, I always look forward to every time we record. <laughs> yeah, and people need have no worries about us running out of topics. I think the spreadsheet of topic ideas has like, an, it currently has like eight more years of ideas on it, <laughs> um, and it keeps growing. Yes, mm. yes. Well, there'll, there'll be a lot. Oh, Jimmy, I guess we're serious we're for a long time to come, we hope. So, uh, Jimmy, why why did we decide to have an episode on hypnosis? Well, it's a mysterious phenomenon. It's not something we experience every day. It's unusual. And that's one reason that it's used for entertainment purposes, you know, on stage. Uh, hypnotized people act strange. It's also not well understood from a scientific perspective. There are scientific disputes about it and about its very nature among hypnotists, even hypnotists don't all agree about its nature, meaning it's a scientific mystery. It's important because it's used in very serious ways, not just for its therapeutic uses, but then, as you mentioned, uh, it's also used in ways that interlock with other mysteries that we cover on this show. And that's really why I wanted to devote an episode just to hypnosis, because it interlocks with all these other mysteries involving true crime investigation alien abduction, past life regression, psychic functioning. I want to devote future episodes to those, but I need, I, at that time, I'll need to be able to refer back and say, okay, so go back and listen to the hypnosis episode if you want more detail on why we're talking about hypnosis in these contexts the way we are. So I basically wanted to do this one to set the stage for all those future mysteries we're going to be discussing. So to start, we we also have to say, since hypnosis is used in medical settings, we need to issue a medical disclaimer. So what is that? 
Right. Well, uh, our show today does not contain medical advice. We are not saying that you should or should not use hypnosis for medical purposes for any particular condition or in preference to or alongside any other treatment. We're just looking at the subject of hypnosis itself, and in particular, its nature, uh, not its medical advisability in particular cases. Okay. Consult your doctor. (laughs) Yeah. So let's begin with the origin of the word itself. Where does the term hypnotism come from? It comes from Greek roots. Uh, The Greek word hypnos or hypnos uh, meant sleep. And then osis indicates a state or condition. So hypnosis would be a condition of sleep. And it's shorthand for nervous hypnosis. Nervous hypnosis is a term that was used earlier on to distinguish nervous, so-called nervous sleep from natural sleep. So the idea is you're not asleep in the natural sense. It's another kind of sleep called nervous sleep or nervous hypnosis, which then got just shortened to hypnosis. And as we've hinted, there's not just one type of hypnosis. There, There are several different kinds we should talk about what are the different kinds of hypnosis? Well, there's stage hypnosis, which is the you know type where people cluck like a chicken and stuff like that. And that's largely non-serious. Then there's therapeutic hypnosis, where hypnosis is used to treat a medical condition. There's also self-hypnosis. Um, it's widely claimed that you don't have to, once you know what you're doing, you don't have to have a hypnotist working with you. You can hypnotize yourself and achieve a lot of the same effects, whether it's, you know, pain management or, you know, appetite management or whatever it may be. So uh, we should probably talk about the history of hypnosis as well. Uh, How long has it been around? Through all of human history, there have been trances that people would go into. There have been, you know, states of meditation that people would, would practice. But the modern era for hypnosis, what we think of as hypnosis, really began in the 1700s with a guy named Franz Mesmer. He lived between 1734 and 1815. He taught something called animal magnetism. Uh, The idea was, you know, magnets were a big thing at the time. People didn't really understand them all that well, but they had this mysterious force that would pass between magnets. And so he envisioned what we now call hypnosis as animal magnetism, as a mysterious force that would pass between us as animals. So you could influence another person with this animal magnetism as opposed to metallic magnetism. He also originally used magnets in his performance, in his practice of hypnosis. And he would use his hands as like channels for the animal magnetism. He would make what were called mesmeric, after him, mesmeric passes with his hands over people. And this led to it often being called mesmerism. It was also often called magnetism after animal magnetism, even though it's distinct from, you know, metal magnets. So the term mesmerized comes from mesmerism. Franz Mesmer, yeah. And uh, the term hypnotism was then coined by a French magnetist, as they were called, or now we'd say a hypnotist, named Etienne de Cuivier, or something like that. If I were to say it the way it's spelled in English, it's Etienne de Cuvillers. But uh, I assume that's something like Cuvier. 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 Uh, And he coined the term in 1820. The Scottish surgeon James Braid, who lived between 1795 and 1860, then helped strip hypnotism of its occult connections. The idea that there's this mysterious animal magnetism force and that there's some kind of occult influence going on. And he explained it purely as a natural, physical and psychological phenomenon. So he took it out of the realm of the occult and said, this is just a natural phenomenon. Let's think about it that way. They started uh, trying to use hypnosis for pain relief during the American Civil War in the 1860s. Uh, Sigmund Freud, one of the founders of modern psychiatry, around 1895 helped popularize age regression hypnotherapy. Uh, As people will be aware, Freud placed in a large amount of importance on early childhood events and early childhood traumas and reactions to things. And he thought those that was the explanation for lots of psychological problems in later life. And so he would want you to hypnotically relive 
those childhood things as a way of desensitizing you to them so that you would get over the traumas that you had experienced and thus won't have the psychological problems that they produced anymore. At least that's the theory that was developed for age regression hypnosis. It's continued to evolve since the time of Sigmund Freud. Today, there are the various therapeutic uses we mentioned, you know, smoking control, weight control, stuff like that. And then there are these more exotic uses. In 1952, a book came out called The Search for Bridie Murphy that used hypnosis as a way of trying to resurface past life memories. There was a woman who claimed to have been a reincarnation of an Irish woman named Bridie Murphy. And this was a big thing in American culture. The search for Bridie Murphy in the 50s was a big deal. They even made movies adapted from it. And then in 1959, there was a guy named Harry Ahrens who started training law enforcement officers and using hypnosis as part of that to help like crime witnesses and crime victims recover memories of the crime. And in 1967, he put out a book called Hypnosis in Criminal Investigation. Then in 1964, Betty and Barney Hill, a couple from New England, experienced what they perceived as an alien abduction, and in the and they underwent hypnosis to help them recover memories from that. And then in the 1990s, there was a huge wave of repressed memory stuff that people were claiming to use hypnosis to bring back of satanic and sexual ritual abuse. And there was basically a, a panic at that time that there was all kinds of satanic and and ritual abuse uh, and sexual abuse going on that people were now having recovered memories from using hypnosis. And we're probably going to talk about uh, Betty and Barney Hill at some point and oh, some of these other gonna, things. Yeah, they're going to get their own episode. So is <laughs> Bridie Murphy. Yeah. OK, good. So that gets us into the subject of what hypnosis is supposed to be able to do. What do people claim that hypnosis does? Well, they'll say that it, it enables you sometimes uh, they'll say it enables you to tap hidden mental powers that you don't normally uh, have or at least can't use as easily. These are supposed to affect things like physical states, uh, psychological states, behavior, and memory. So what effect is hypnosis supposed to have on physical states? It's supposed to allow you to promote re physical relaxation, uh, lower your blood pressure, cure insomnia, diminish pain. And uh, that includes, this is called hypnotic anesthesia, when you use it to diminish pain. It's used sometimes in childbirth and dental procedures. It's supposed to help you improve your performance in sports. And some claim that it lets you do things that are either normally physically impossible or nearly impossible physical feats, like walking on beds of coals or beds of spikes or levitate or make your body completely rigid. In fact, for the artwork for this episode, we've got a picture of that where you have a guy who's hypnotized, his body's completely rigid, and he's just got like a chair under his neck and under his feet, and he's just suspended there between the two with a completely rigid body. What about psychological states? What effect is supposed, uh, hypnosis supposed to have on that? It's supposed to let you work out psychological problems, for example, with age regression hypnotherapy, where you relive some traumatic event and desensitize yourself to it. It's supposed to help you control alleged addictions like alcohol, tobacco, or gambling. It's supposed to help you deal with unwanted compulsive thoughts like phobias or fear of flying or obsessive compulsive disorder. And it's supposed to help with anxiety control by desensitizing you and promoting relaxation. And then it, you said it's supposed to have effects on behavior. What, what about that? Yeah, well, this can include things like changing behavior patterns through what are called post-hypnotic suggestions. So the idea is you hypnotize someone and you say, when you wake up, you're not going to have a desire to smoke anymore, or you're not going to have a desire to eat as much anymore. And so you change their post-hypnotic behavior in hypnosis. It's also used in hypnosis to get people to do acts they wouldn't normally do, like, you know, act like a chicken, or some people think, although this claim is widely rejected by hypnotherapists, uh, getting people to do things like commit crimes like robbery or assassination. You know, that's a major 
plot element in the Manchurian Candidate. Right. And you will find some people saying, oh, yeah, you can do that. And then you'll have hypnotherapists saying, oh, no, you can't. Hollywood loves that, the, the hypnotized assassin thing. Yeah. <laughs> so what effect is hypnosis supposed to have on memory? It's supposed to either be able to enhance memory, thus helping you recover repressed memories, or diminish memory in through what's known as hypnotic amnesia, so help you forget things. Uh, the, there was a movie, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which was uh -huh. like on that premise. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's move past the claimed effects and then just look at hypnosis's basic nature. What is hypnosis? How is it defined? There are many definitions, and none of them are universally agreed upon. The American Psychological Association has a definition, which is currently on their website. And if you could, Dom, could you read us uh, from that definition? Sure. According to the American Psychological Association's Division 30, Society of Psychological Hypnosis, hypnosis is a procedure during which a health professional or researcher suggests, while treating someone, that he or she experience changes in sensations, perceptions, thoughts, or behavior. Although some hypnosis is used to make people more alert, most hypnosis includes suggestions for relaxation, calmness, and well-being. Instructions to imagine or think about pleasant experiences are also commonly included during hypnosis. People respond to hypnosis in different ways. Some describe hypnosis as a state of focused attention in which they feel very calm and relaxed, most people describe the experience as pleasant. Okay, so this definition reflects the disagreement among professionals. You'll notice it says hypnosis is a procedure, but it doesn't talk about what the state of hypnosis is. And that's because there are different theories about this. Okay, that takes us to theories. What are the theories about what hypnosis is? There are a bunch of variations, but they basically boil down to two overarching ones. These are called the state theory of hypnosis and the non-state theory of hypnosis. Okay, so let's start with the state theory. What's state hypothesis? Basically, that hypnosis is a distinct state of mind that is comparable to other states, like ordinary wakefulness or sleep, or for that matter, hallucination. You know, those are there's a marked distinction between the state of being awake or the state of being asleep or the state of hallucinating. And basically, the claim is that hypnosis is like that. It's a it's another distinct state of mind, and people who advocate this view, use terms like hypnotic state, or in the past, they would tend to use hypnotic trance. And you'll also find them using the term altered state of consciousness. The key is it's somehow fundamentally distinct from ordinary states of consciousness, like, like normal wakefulness or sleep. Okay. And then, so what's the non-state hypothesis? Basically, that it's not a distinct state of consciousness. Now, it clearly isn't sleep. That would suggest, according to a non-state theorist, that it's really just a form of normal waking consciousness. And there are different ways of articulating this. Sometimes some non-state theorists will say it's basically a social role. You really are awake. You're just performing a social role that you've learned from watching other people be hypnotized. And you know you're supposed to act sleepy and follow instructions. And that's really all it is. You're just performing this role. It's also thought of sometimes in terms of its cognitive behavioral aspects, like essentially you are awake, you're in normal waking consciousness, you just relax, focus your attention, and follow instructions. And that's all you're doing. And those options are not mutually exclusive. You can say it's it's both you're doing these things and you're doing them because it's a learned social role. The difference between the state and non-state hypotheses really comes down to how you interpret the phrase state of consciousness. Here's a definition of hypnosis that was issued in 2014 by the Society of Psychological Hypnosis, which is that Division 30 of the American Psychological Association. They defined hypnosis as a state of consciousness focused, involving focused attention and reduced peripheral awareness characterized by an enhanced capacity for response to suggestion. Now, a non-state theorist could agree with almost everything in that except 
the potentially loaded phrase state of consciousness. If you just said hypnosis is when a person focuses their attention, reduces peripheral awareness, and responds to suggestions, it would be the same as a non-state definition. So uh, we're approaching this from the faith and reason perspective. Is there a faith perspective on hypnosis? Yeah, um, rather interestingly, and could be surprising for some folks, you know, when mesmerism was all the rage in Europe, you know, it was originally presented as as this kind of occult thing before Mm -hmm. the Scottish uh, doctor stripped it of those connotations. And so you'd have these hypnosis parties or animal magnetism parties going on, and that raised questions of how does this relate to the Catholic faith? And so the Holy Office, now the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, over in Rome actually weighed in on this, and they issued a variety of statements. Some of them were cautioning against the abuse of it, for example, to justify superstitions. But if it's understood as just a natural practice, like Dr. Baird suggested, then the Holy Office didn't have a problem with it. And so on July 28th, 1847, the Holy Office issued a statement on this. You can find this in Denzinger, if, which is a collection of excerpts from official church documents. In the old numbering system, it's paragraph 1653. In the new denzinger Hernerman edition, it's paragraph 2824. But, Dom, could you read us what the Holy Office had to say? Sure. When all error, soothsaying, explicit or implicit invocation of the demon is removed, the use of magnetism, that is, the mere act of employing physical means otherwise licit, is not morally forbidden, provided it does not tend to an illicit end or to one that is in any manner perverse. Yeah, so they're saying basically as long as you're not doing something occult with it, as long as you understand it as a natural thing, you can use it as long as you're not doing something bad with it, like try to seduce a woman or something like that. Later statements in the 1950s issued by Pope Pius XII also accepted uh, its use in principle for pain relief under a medical practitioner's care. All use of it, though, for occult purposes like past life regression uh, would be ruled out. So that's the faith perspective. What can we say about this from the reason perspective? How can we judge between the state and non-state hypotheses? To show that it's a distinct state of consciousness, you need to show that it's somehow significantly different from other states of consciousness. And it's obviously different from sleep, so that's not under dispute. The question is whether it's significantly different from ordinary wakefulness. One way of doing this would be by direct physiological measures. For example, looking at the brain waves or the activation of brain regions in people who are awake versus hypnotized. Another way would be looking at its reported effects and seeing if a person in a wakeful state could reasonably do the same things as a person in a hypnotized state. Now, I would like to be able to say, here are a bunch of scientific studies that I can point you to. Unfortunately, Scientific studies tend to be behind paywalls on the internet, and there aren't that many open source journals, especially dealing with hypnosis. I, I, if you want the high quality studies, that's really where you have to go. And right now, we don't really have a, a research budget yeah. for this show. I'm paying for all the resources that we mention on this show out of my own pocket, just as a donation to StarQuest. But I would love for us to be able to improve. Im- have a research budget, but first StarQuest needs to get to the break-even point, because right now we're not even covering all of our current expenses, and we need to get additional donations to where we can just break even so we can continue to do the show for another eight years. We're not there yet, but with your help, we hope to get there. But then even beyond that, I'd love to get a research budget so I could get access to more of these studies, uh, because as it's sometimes pointed out, scholarship is expensive. I do the best I can with what I can out of my own pocket, but I'd love, we'd love to have our patrons uh, fund us to the point we can not only keep doing the show, but can even bring you additional findings from serious studies. We'd love to take this show to the next level. Absolutely. Yes, uh, I wholeheartedly <laughs> would, Jimmy. I would love to give him a big research budget to, uh, to, to do that. 
So we've got the ability to measure the brain now. So what do those measurements show about the brain? Okay, so we have several different types of brain waves. This is something we've been able to measure for a while. There are alpha waves, beta waves, gamma waves, theta waves, so forth. And hypnotized people do show changes in their brain waves, but so do people who are sitting down, relaxing, and focusing their attention. Every time you think a different thought, it's going to change your brain waves a little bit, and you do some of those things. You sit down, relax, focus attention. It's going to influence your brain waves in this kind of the same way as when you're hypnotized. So at present, there doesn't appear, from what I've been able to establish, that there is a consensus that hypnosis involves a distinct state based on brain waves. That hasn't emerged as a consensus. So the state hypothesis has not been proven by brain waves. So what about measuring the activation of brain regions like they do with an fMRI? Uh, it's essentially the same thing. Hypnosis, hypnotized people do show that they're activating certain brain regions and not others, but so do people who just relax and focus their attention on the same things. Again, there's no consensus that we're dealing with a significantly different state. Both the brainwave and brain region measurements, though, bring up a really important point, which is that anytime you hear a claim about hypnosis and the effects it has, you need to ask if it was controlled against a similar non-hypnotic procedure. It's not, it, it doesn't do any good to have experiments with no control group. And so if you, and the control group, in order to test between the state and non-state hypothesis, is going to need to have people who are trying to achieve the same thing, even though they're not hypnotized. They're just say, relaxing and focusing. So anytime you hear a claim about, well, this changed under hypnosis, you need to say, if you're trying to distinguish the state from non-state hypothesis, you need to say, did the researchers tell some of their subjects to relax and focus and do the same thing without trying to induce hypnosis in them? And we'll refer to studies that do that as adequately controlled, provided an alternative non-hypnotic attempt to do the same thing just by relaxing and concentrating. So what about the effects hypnosis is supposed to have on physical states? So let's consider what happens to these claims if we imagine them being adequately controlled. One of the claimed physical effects is promoting relaxation, but that's not proof of a true altered state of consciousness. If you just tell somebody to relax, it'll do the same thing, whether you try to hypnotize them or not. Same thing goes for lowering blood pressure. That's a natural consequence of relaxing. And the same thing goes for curing insomnia. If you tell someone to relax and focus on going to sleep, they'll fall asleep quicker. So the effects, you know, can be reasonably accomplished by someone who's just relaxing and concentrating without being hypnotized. One of the claimed physical effects is improving sports performance. What about that? Yeah. And again, you know, let's apply the adequate control test again. So here we may be able to explain improvements in performance by two well-known non-hypnotic effects. Uh, the first one is something you might call the power of positive thinking. You could also you know, call it the optimism effect. If you relax and focus and tell yourself you can do something athletically, the chances of doing it improve. But you don't have to be hypnotized for that to happen. It's just an increasing motivation and confidence. The second effect that can play a role here is called the placebo effect. Placebo it comes from uh, the Latin word. It means, from the Latin word placebo, it means I will please. And scientists have known for a long time that if a patient believes a treatment is likely to work, even if it has no intrinsic efficacy, like a sugar pill, it may well work anyway. And there's actually placebo effect is very fascinating. And uh, we'll be doing an episode in the future on placebo. But if you have a, if a hypnosis patient believes that hypnosis is intrinsically effective, well, that's going to add the placebo effect to whatever benefits they're already getting from the optimism effect. As far as I can tell, sports improvements from hypnosis have not been shown to outperform what you would expect from optimism and placebo. So, uh, you know, you'd really want to control this by saying, okay, let's get some athletes and half of them we're going to hypnotize and half of them we're going to tell to relax and focus and, 
you know, tell themselves they can do this and we're going to give them a sugar pill and tell them that's going to help. And then C, does one group notably outperform the other? And what about claims of diminishing pain, like in childbirth or during dental procedures? Well, if you relax and tell yourself something won't be painful or as painful, then it probably won't be. I mean, we have a remarkable ability to focus our attention and screen out distractions. The effects of the ability of placebo to diminish pain is already well known in psychological circles. Also, people do undergo natural childbirth. Most women in history have had natural childbirth simply because there were no painkillers invented yet. And dental procedures are often mild in comparison to childbirth. So people can relax and say, okay, this isn't going to be so bad. I can deal with this, even without being hypnotized. Yeah. I mean, I have to say that I've, you know, used the relax and and tell myself that something won't be painful in order to do things that would otherwise normally like pick up something hot or um, that sort of thing. Uh, to, so in other words, just to think myself out of it. So I, I see what yeah. you're saying there. Yeah. Also, like you think about like children, when we were kids, shots were terrifying and uniformly painful. And as adults, they're not such a big deal. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, I don't I don't I've never watched Cross Coles, but I have watched Cross Legos, which is uh, twice as painful. Uh -huh. And uh, and I have been <laughs> yeah. able to do it uh, without having to be uh -huh. hypnotized. So, uh, so that, that's, a, that's a, some evidence there. So what you've said covers fairly ordinary physical effects that might be achieved without hypnosis. But what about some of the physical effects that are ordinarily thought to be impossible or nearly impossible to achieve without hypnosis. So our artwork for this episode, as we mentioned, has a photo of a seemingly dramatic example of hypnotic rigidity of a man suspended between two chairs. But in the show notes, I'll provide a video of Penn and Teller doing a non-hypnotic levitation trick where they don't even use the second chair. And it's non-hypnotic. You know the woman they're, they're doing this with is not hypnotized because they're telling her she's not hypnotized and they're cracking jokes with her right. at the same time. So they're not putting her under and they're telling her she's not under and then they're making her laugh. So it's been shown that you really can make your body quite rigid and you don't have to, you don't have to be hypnotized to do that. So what about the effects that hypnosis is supposed to have on psychological states? Well, it depends on the way it's supposed to help. In some cases with hypnotherapy, people mentally are supposed to relive prior experience to put them, the prior experiences in perspective so that they lose their emotional punch. And that's actually similar to what's done in what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, in which a person is exposed to a distressing stimulus so that it loses its power over the person so that you realize I don't have to give this thing power over me. And that's used to deal with phobias and OCD and things like that. So let's say a person has arachnophobia. They're afraid of spiders. Well, gradually you get them exposed more and more to spiders. So it's like, mm, okay, I can survive spiders and I don't have to be terrified of them. And in the same way, it's like, okay, I had this traumatic experience in the past, so I'm going to relive it and realize, hey, I'm okay despite that. So it loses its power over me. Well, again, just relaxing and focusing and telling yourself you can do something is going to help you do it. And that's going to apply to desensitizing yourself, whether you're hypnotized or not. If you mentally relive events and say, okay, I can deal with this. I got through that. It's not a big deal. I'm not even going to be scared of it. I'm going to let myself think about it. You're going to desensitize yourself. Similarly, if you relax and say, you know, I can control my alcohol or tobacco or food consumption or gambling or anxiety, whether or not you're hypnotized, you're going to be able to accomplish some of that. And I have not been able to find studies showing that hypnosis has markedly different outcomes than doing the same things without the hypnotic effect, just relaxing and saying, I'm, I can do this. Right. And to be clear, what we're saying is, is it's not that anybody could positive, you know, uh, think themselves into a positive outcome with this, but that whether you're hypnotized or not, the percentage of people who are able to to do this isn't markedly different. That's what you're saying. Not as, not as far as I've been able to find studies on, no. Okay. All right. So what about the effects that hypnosis is supposed to have on behavior? 
Well, if it's a minor behavior that a person wants to do anyway, like eating less or stopping smoking, then that can be explained without proposing hypnosis as an altered state of consciousness. It's just the power of positive thinking and or the placebo effect. The real question comes when it's something a person ordinarily wouldn't do, like acting like a chicken or committing a crime. In the case of acting like a chicken, well, you you know, you see that in stage hypnosis and the way stage hypnotists work is they first typically try to hypnotize the entire audience. And then they select a few people who they were able to hypnotize out of the audience and get them up on stage to do weird stuff. From a non-state perspective, that can be just seen as selecting people who are willing to play the social role of being a hypnotized subject. So you tell everyone in the audience you're getting really sleepy, and then you say, okay, who felt like they were really sleepy? Come on up. (laughs) Well, you can just say that's just selecting the people who are willing to play along. Once the person is up on stage, they have social pressure, both from the hypnotist and the audience that's watching them to keep playing the role. And that social pressure gives them permission to act in a weird way that will please the hypnotist and the audience. So, you know, nobody wants a party pooper up there on stage defying the hypnotist. And if you act weird, you can just pass it off as, well, I was hypnotized. I didn't have any control over it. Yeah. It gives permission in that case. Okay. Well, so that's a... You know, the fun stage hypnotism. What about more serious things like committing a crime, like an assassination? So people in the hypnosis community claim that you can't get a person to do something that is fundamentally against their moral code. Uh, For example, here's what the Society for Psychological Hypnosis says is a misconception about hypnosis in their pamphlet, hypnosis, what it is, and how it can help you feel better. All right, I'll read that. Misconception one. The person being hypnotized will be under the control of the hypnotist and can be made to do or say anything the hypnotist wants. Fact. This is not true. No matter how deeply hypnotized you become, you will remain in control throughout the session. You cannot be made to do anything you do not want to do or anything that you are uncomfortable doing. That seems to be the case, and it's evidence that's consistent with the non-state hypothesis. If you could get someone to fundamentally violate their waking moral code, then that would be evidence that hypnosis is a distinct moral, a mental state. But if you can't, then that's evidence that a person's waking moral code is really what's in control. Hypnosis may give you permission to do something minor you're not really opposed to, like clucking like a chicken, but it won't give you permission to do something that you're opposed to in waking life, like assassinating someone. So we thus don't have good behavioral evidence for hypnosis being a distinct state of consciousness. What about the effects that hypnosis is supposed to have on memory, either like recovering or repressing it? Well, this is the big one because a lot of the hypnosis-related topics we're going to be doing in future episodes are related to memory retrieval. This episode, this area, though, is really easy to study because it's easy to teach people things just before or during hypnosis, and then see how well they can record them. I mean, that's like classic psychological lab experiment. So let's start with the small stuff, like remembering the details of something that just recently happened. There are claims that hypnosis will help you retrieve those, but so will sitting quietly, relaxing, and focusing your attention on what happened, especially if you're guided through what happened step by step it's likely to bring back things you'd temporarily forgotten. And that's why when you lose your car keys, the first thing your spouse asks is where you were the last time you remembered having them so that you can mentally walk forward from that point until you remember where you put them. Or usually in the last place where I remembered having them. <laughs> in my yeah. case. Oh, they're right there. Uh, so what, what about hypnotic amnesia where the hypnotist gets you to forget stuff? Here we have to distinguish between uh, the small stuff and the large stuff. In stage hypnosis, you sometimes encounter instructions to forget everything that happened during hypnosis. If that could be achieved, it would be evidence that hypnosis is a distinct state of consciousness. Because if someone's in normal waking consciousness, you can't just tell them forget everything that just happened in the last five minutes. But I haven't been able to establish that this kind of complete and utter forgetting really happens. I mean, some subjects 
of stage hypnosis may claim it does, but I think it's part of the performance. You know, I think they're just saying, oh, yeah, oh, I can't remember anything. I think that's part of the performance they're just going along with. That leaves us with forgetting small things like individual facts learned shortly before or during hypnosis. It seems that there are studies indicating that hypnosis can be used to cause people to forget small little details like that. Not everything that happened, but some little details. This can be explained by another effect called the nocebo effect. Nocebo is Latin for I will harm. It's the flip side of the placebo effect. So instead of, for example, instead of giving someone a shot and saying, you'll just feel a little pinch, you say, I'm afraid this is going to hurt rather a lot. (laughs) (laughs) And, And like the placebo effect, the nocebo effect really does work. So you can prime someone who's relaxed and focused by saying, You will be able to remember the items from the list I'm about to tell you, and they'll be able to remember them better. Or you can say, you'll have a hard time remembering the items from the list I'm about to tell you. And with that kind of discouraging message, it's no surprise when they don't recall them as well. So I think the hypnotic amnesia effect you get where you can't remember all the terms you were told I think it can be explained due to um, due to the nocebo effect that you're you're just discouraging people from being able to remember, and that disheartening message makes it harder for them to remember. So I just don't see small scale hypnotic amnesia as providing evidence for a distinct state of consciousness. So if it's possible for hypnosis to affect whether you can remember recently learned things or recent experiences, what about its potential to help you remember or recover things that aren't recent? And that you've completely forgotten. I don't want to discount the possibility that hypnosis could help you recall something minor that you haven't thought about in years. Like, oh, yeah, I was on this bridge and I saw this beautiful woman walk past and I haven't thought about that in years. But so could just relaxing, focusing and thinking back. Or having a smell or or seeing a picture or various other things. Yep. Yeah. To provide evidence for a true altered state of consciousness, you'd need something more dramatic than that. And this is where claims come in that you could remember major events like childhood sexual abuse or past lives or alien abductions. To bolster the claim that such recall is possible, you sometimes, although not always, encounter claims that the mind is like a video recorder that captures everything that happens to us. It's just a question of recalling it. And the claim is sometimes made that we apparently have a faulty recall circuit that hypnosis can compensate for. But this is not borne out by the evidence. That's not how memory works, as we'll discuss in a future episode on memory. The mind is not just a video recorder that captures everything that happens to us. Whether, though, memory works like a video camera isn't really the issue. The question is whether the evidence shows that hypnosis can accurately bring back details of this kind of event. Back in the 90s, a lot of people thought it was possible, and that led to a major scare about repressed memories of childhood sexual abuse. Lots of families were shattered. People had their lives ruined. They lost their jobs. Some of them went to jail. In response, some of the devastated families founded the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, to promote awareness of the problem. And we'll have a link to that in the uh, show notes. Hypnosis was then supposedly used to recover a lot of these repressed memories. But the evidence is that a huge number of the allegedly repressed memories were false, likely unintentionally planted by misguided therapists. And you can see how that would work. If your therapist tells you to remember, like you come in for some psychological problem, and the therapist tells you your problem is caused by something that happened to you in your childhood, let's hypnotize you and find out what that was. Well, if your, if your therapist tells you to remember something that happened to you, that implies that you can remember it, and that gives you permission to use your imagination to remember, to envision the event. And then the placebo effect of your thinking that this has the ability to really help you do that 
gives you confidence that what you're imagining was actually a real memory. So it's basically permission given by the hypnosis to envision this thing and then the placebo effect making you think it must be a real memory. In fact, you don't even have to be hypnotized to have false memories implanted. There's a professor of psychology, and she's also an adjunct professor of law named Elizabeth Loftus. She's done a lot of work in this area. We're going to have references to her books. But she has done a lot of work specifically on how false memories affect court cases. She is one of the key experts in the field, and she's done a bunch of studies on implanting false memories in people. For example, suggesting to them that they were lost in a shopping mall when they were five, when their parents say, no, that never happened. And then getting them to recall being lost in a shopping mall when they were five as if it really happened. In 1997, she published an article in Scientific American called Creating False Memories. And she described the various ways they can be created, including memories of events that occurred in the first year of life when the hypothalamus is too immature to generate the, these kinds of memories. So these are like impossible memories, but she talks about how you can create them in people. And Dom, could you read us a little from the article? Sure. A procedure for planting impossible memories about experiences that occur shortly after birth has been developed by the late Nicholas Spanos and his collaborators at Carleton University. Individuals are led to believe that they have well-coordinated eye movements and visual exploration skills, probably because they were born in hospitals that hung swinging colored mobiles over infant cribs. To confirm whether they had such an experience, half the participants are hypnotized age regressed to the day after birth, and asked what they remembered. The other half of the group participates in a guided mnemonic restructuring procedure that uses age regression as well as active encouragement to recreate the infant experiences by imagining them. Spanos and, Spanos and his co-workers found that the vast majority of their subjects were susceptible to these memory-planting procedures. Both the hypnotic and guided participants reported infant memories. Surprisingly, the guided group did so somewhat more, 95 versus 70 percent. Both groups remembered the colored mobile at a relatively high rate, 56 percent of the guided group and 46 percent of the hypnotic subjects. Many participants who did not remember the mobile did recall other things, such as doctors, nurses, bright lights, cribs, and masks. Also in both groups of those who reported memories of infancy, 49% felt that they were real memories, as opposed to 16% who claimed that they were merely fantasies. These findings confirm earlier studies that many individuals can be led to construct complex, vivid, and detailed false memories via a rather simple procedure. Hypnosis clearly is not necessary. Yeah, so notice what Loftus says. Hypnosis is clearly is not necessary. You can create the same false memories even in a non-hypnotic state. And that is a huge warning light about using hypnosis or other techniques like guided imagery when it comes to recovering distant, forgotten, or repressed memories. Consequently, competent authorities recommend against putting confidence in alleged memories produced under hypnosis. As early as 1985, so this is before the big scare in the 90s, as early as 85, the American Medical Association's Council on Scientific Affairs stated, the council finds that recollections obtained during hypnosis can involve confabulations and pseudo-memories and not only fail to be more accurate, but actually appear to be less reliable than non-hypnotic recall. Similarly, in the abstract of his paper, Hypnosis, Memory, and Amnesia, John F. Kilstrom writes, Hypnotic hyper hyperamnesia refers to improved memory for past events. However, such improvements are illusory. Hypermnesia suggests increased false recollection as well as subjects' confidence in both true and false memories. Hypnotic age regression can be subjectively compelling, but does not involve the ablation of adult memory or the instatement of childhood of childlike modes of mental functioning or the revivification of memory. The clinical and forensic use of hypermnesia and age regression to enhance memory in patients, victims, and witnesses 
for example, recovered memory therapy for child sexual abuse, should be discouraged. So using hypnosis to recover distant memories is really problematic. I remember back in the 90s, there were some very big cases in the news here in the Boston area about a, like one of them was about a family that had a daycare and the entire family was sent to yeah. prison. And years, years later, after being in prison, eventually were released uh, when it turned out to be all be false. It was fantastically crazy. So yeah. uh, very significant, very significant. So uh, the bottom line, uh, let's pull back to the top level. What can we say about the state versus non-state debate on hypnosis? Researchers are divided on it, and there are hypnotists on both sides of the discussion. There are state and non-state hypnotists. My own sense is that hypnosis is most likely a socially learned role that involves relaxing, concentrating, and following instructions. I can't rule out that there is a true altered state of consciousness involved in hypnosis sometimes, but if so, its effects seem to be small. So does that mean that hypnosis is fake? No. Uh, saying that something is a social role, a social construct, doesn't mean that it isn't a real thing. It also doesn't mean that it can't have therapeutic effects. Uh, the power of positive thinking is real, as is the placebo effect. So I wouldn't tell, some, I wouldn't tell someone they shouldn't or should use hypnosis to help lose weight or stop smoking or control anxiety or whatever else. But I do think it's problematic to describe it as an altered state of consciousness. I don't think we have good evidence for that. And I especially think it's problematic to try to use it as a way of recovering distant memories. As Agent Scully said, it promotes confabulation. And that's my bottom line. Excellent. And remember, folks, as we said at the beginning, uh, we're not medical professionals. Uh, do what your doctor says. <laughs> not us. Further resources, Jimmy, what further resources can we point people to uh, on this subject? We'll have a link to a book by Robert Baker called They Call It Hypnosis, which advocates the non-state view. Elizabeth Loftus's book, The Myth of Repressed Memory, will also have a link to that. Wikipedia's article, Hypnosis, which actually has a, a pretty good discussion of the state versus non-state debate. Also, Wikipedia on the placebo effect will have Penn and Teller's most definitely non-hypnotic levitation trick. We'll have a TED Talk by a stage hypnotist on stage with stage hypnotist subjects called Is Hypnosis Fake? We'll have Elizabeth Loftus's Scientific American article, Creating False Memories, a uh, link to the False Memory Syndrome Foundation website, John Kilstrom's article, Hypnosis, Memory, and Amnesia, as well as the current American Psychological Association definition of hypnosis on their page, the 2014 definition from the Society of Psychological Hypnotists, Society of Psychological Hypnosis, will also have a link to their pamphlet, Hypnosis, What It Is and How It Can Help You Feel Better. And we will have a link to the 1996, uh, sorry, 1966 U.S. intelligence document, Hypnosis in Intelligence, mm. which actually concluded hypnosis is not very useful for intelligence gathering. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, and also Pius XII's 1956 address religious and moral implications of analgesia, where he talks about the possible use of hypnosis for pain control. All right. Well, that's those are some good resources. So let's move on to our mysterious feedback. Uh, this week we're we're talking about feedback from our John Hendricks Tennessee Prophet episode. Uh, the first comment comes from. Uh, Carthago Delinda Est uh, on YouTube, who wrote, Jimmy, you know who else can give accurate predictions of the future? Demons. No calls to repentance, no calls for conversion. I have a hard time believing this is of God. So we had a few people challenge the idea that Hendrix received visions of the future based on the fact that the episode didn't mean, didn't mention calls for repentance. I would say a couple things about that. The first one is because we're dealing with oral history, we don't know that there weren't calls for repentance. In fact, Hendrix, when he, when he escaped from the county farm, he said the county farm was a wicked place and God was going to destroy it, which then happened. You know, it was struck by lightning and burned down. And so that could be understood as a condemnation of moral stuff. Of, you know, like the biblical prophets warning if, you know, there's sin going on here, it's going to bring about punishment. So there actually is some evidence for that kind of stuff in the oral history. But 
even if there wasn't, it may not be because Hendricks didn't warn people they needed to repent. It may be because they were more interested in the future stuff that happened than they were in the moral repent stuff, because that's normal. People are normally more curious about what's going to happen in the future than do I need to repent. And so since we're just dealing with oral history, it's not like we have transcripts of everything Hendricks said. It could be he warned people to repent all the time, and that just wasn't what they were interested in remembering. It was like, oh, wow, the that prophecy about the railroad and the massive city, all that stuff came true. Then there is another fact, which is if you look at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith's guidelines that are sent to bishops for discerning authentic apparitions from false apparitions, they nowhere mention calls to repent as something that you need to have to have a true apparition. So the people who have said, oh, well, I, I didn't hear a call to repent, therefore this thing must be false, you're making up a criteria the church does not use. So I would say for all those reasons, we do have some elements of you know, moral censure in his prophecies. We don't have a complete record of his prophecies. It would be expected for people to focus more on the amazing fulfillments than on the calls to repent. And this is not a test the church uses. I don't find that line of argument convincing. Yeah. I, I, even in big approved apparitions in the Catholic Church, uh, people tend to focus more on the predictions and secrets yeah. than they do yeah. on the calls to repentance. Well, look, look, can I ask you about his one of uh -huh. the statements? He says demons can give accurate predictions of the future. Is, is that true? There's some debate on that. There's a it's it's generally agreed in Catholic theology that demons at least have a superhuman intellect that allows them to make accurate or more than humanly accurate predictions okay. regarding the future. Whether they can see the future is another thing, but they can at least calculate what's likely to happen in the future better than we can. And thus, you could, like, for example, Saint, in the book of Acts, Luke records that St. Paul encountered a young woman who had a spirit that her owners were using to predict the future to make money. And so you could interpret that either as the spirit can directly see the future or some things about the future, or at least that the spirit could calculate things that were likely to happen in the future. Right. Or give vague enough things that could be could be said to be a prediction of the future. Yeah. Like like you know, tarot cards and that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh so and then our next comment comes from uh, oh, oh. One, yeah. one other thing about demons. Yeah. Before I attribute and this is this is standard with me before I want to attribute something to demons, because this is the classic thing that a lot of people fall into. If it's if it's unusual, if it's outside of our tribe, it must be demons. Right. Well, OK, no. Demons want to lead you away from God if it, that's what they're about. And so if we don't have evidence of demons trying to trick people into into somehow being led away from God, I don't, we shouldn't be saying something is demons. That brings ridicule on the Christian faith when people hear it, demons, demons, demons as the explanation for things. So in this case, we don't have, you know, we don't have John Hendricks saying things like, oh, adultery is just fine or stuff like that. So every, just saying, oh, well, it feeds curiosity about the future. Yeah, because humans are curious about the future. That's part of why God gives us prophecies about the future. Mere curiosity is not leading us away from God. So, and then uh, we have another comment from uh, Mayol Siklan on YouTube who says, Wonderful, a mystery I've never heard of. Thank you so much. This is great. Yeah, I, I was delighted when I first discovered the story of John Hendricks. It was something that not a lot of people have heard about, and I love being able to share it with others. Uh, Bill Will, B. Will 140 on YouTube says, these are getting more views. Nice. Yeah, the YouTube videos are getting more views, and it's uh, in part because of people liking and subscribing and commenting on them. That tells YouTube's algorithm that uh, you like it, and therefore other people might like it, and so it starts showing them to more people. So we really appreciate all you do in that regard. Yes, very much. Uh, Kathy S. writes on YouTube, this was my favorite uh, so far, along with the Outlaw Pass. I ordered the book and will also up my monthly SQPN donation as a vote for more of this sort of episode, oral and formal history, 
interesting personalities combined with supernatural events. And great job telling the story dramatically, including the clip with President Truman. Thanks, Jimmy and Dom. I like the Egyptian stuff a lot, too. Thank you so much. And we want to we really appreciate your support, including uh, raising your level of support. That's something uh, I hope other people will do, too, because we still need to get to break even for the network. And if you enjoy these episodes, then by all means, please either begin supporting or increase your support so we can continue to bring you the show for years to come. We really enjoy doing it. And we always love to know uh, what kinds of episodes you like. And that's one of the reasons we ask our patrons every month what what they'd like us to take on next. Uh, and then the last is an email from Myra Mansfield, who wrote the, the book that you referenced on uh, John Hendricks. And she writes, thank you. I've been selling some books from your broadcast. I noticed you've been receiving conversation on your channel. Best wishes for continued success. And it was great to hear from Myra Mansfield. Uh, her book is excellent. And if you order it through Amazon, uh, she even autographs it for you. It's a short read. I read it in one sitting, but it's a fascinating look at the time of John Hendricks and also at his life and his predictions. And uh, I recommend it to everybody. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, you'll find the links to that book on our website. You can go to sqpn.com slash mysterious, and then there'll be a link there to our Mysterious World bookstore, and you can look for the book there. So, Jimmy, what are our mysterious headlines for the week? Well, the first one is one that you called to my attention. I'd read about it elsewhere, but you actually sent me the link. And it's about the FBI releasing its file on Bigfoot. The FBI did some investigation of Bigfoot a while back, and so they've now released their file on it. Also, speaking of cryptids like Bigfoot, hidden animals, Matthew B. Rose has, over on Catholic Exchange, has been doing a Catholic look at cryptids based in part on uh, Mysterious World. So uh, check out uh, Matthew B. Rose's multi-part series on a Catholic perspective on cryptids. Yes, thanks for listening, Matthew. It's great to see you take the ball and uh, move it down the field uh, like that. That's really awesome. So uh, in a minute, I'll ask Jimmy what our next episode is going to be. But uh, first, I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons like Kathy, who make this show possible. And this week, I want to thank Father Andrew, Bob M., Joe B., Amy F., and Sean M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, hopefully for many years to come, and all the shows we do at StarQuest. You can join them in supporting our mission by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Well, it's our monthly patrons episode, and this time the patrons have said they want us to tell them about a very mysterious object that no one really understands called the Bet's Sphere. Yes, and disclaimer, not this Bet, uh, Bettinelli. No, Bet's, <laughs> Bet's with a Z. That's the right. The Bet's Sphere. <laughs> I have uh, another podcast with my wife called Raising the Bet's. Totally different thing. So that's it from us. What did you think about the? What do you think about hypnosis in general and uh, our discussion about state versus non-state? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page and leaving some feedback there on the episode. You can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. You can send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of Mysterious Feedback, all one word. Uh, like I said, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions on the show, including Myra Mansfield's book on John Hendricks and the ones we mentioned today. You can find links to all of Jimmy's resources from this discussion and links to the Mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>